Hi, everyone, and welcome to VMware's Partnership Perspectives. I'm Kathleen Tandy, Vice President of Global Partner and Alliance Marketing at VMware, and I'm excited to bring you the stories from our VMware partners, tech and business executives, and industry analysts. This week, we invited Todd Weber, CTO at Optiv, to join us for a conversation around enterprise security. Together, we discuss the value of end-to-end cybersecurity technology integration, emerging security trends in our post-pandemic world, and the importance of protecting our personal data and security. Let's get started. So, Todd, let's start with Optiv. I know that Optiv is well known to people who are rooted in the cybersecurity world, but for a broader audience, can you give us a quick overview of Optiv, your primary value proposition to customers, what sets Optiv apart, and how you've worked with VMware over the years? No problems. Optiv, as you mentioned, is a pure play cybersecurity service integrator. We are the largest dedicated cybersecurity service integrator in the world, and that has evolved from a lot of places, from a lot of different companies, uh, including where I started about 16 years ago at a company called Acuvant. And along the way, we were merged and formed together with Fishnet and others into Optiv by some private equity firms, including Blackstone and KKR. We have about 2,000 cybersecurity employees here at Optiv, supporting well over 7,000 clients around the world. And it's been an incredible journey, starting off mainly as a VAR, but also with uh, some services functions. But it's really been a journey through listening to our clients, particularly who have been consumers of much of this technology over time. And as you mentioned, it's one of the more dynamic environments going on right now. And so there's a lot of different technologies available. There's a lot of different options. Plus, it doesn't stay static. The attackers move around a lot, which required different technologies. And as people move their business models and move their application sets from, you know, premise to cloud, that incorporates different types of things. And then as your service providers also move to cloud, then that opens the attack surface into different. We've been on this journey to listen to our clients quite a lot. And through that, they don't just want to buy and consume technology. They need to consume it in a way that's more meaningful. And as they've bought more and more technology over time, they also need efficiencies gained through doing that. It, it's a different industry than, than, say, compute or storage, where there's only like maybe five to 10 major players. In some cases, in part of my job in keeping track of uh, a lot of cybersecurity companies, I keep track of well over 2,000. And they're particularly probably two to 300 that are actually moving out of stealth mode every year. So, I mean, it's a huge dynamic environment and clients don't necessarily want to add technology number 80 or 81 or 82. They might have to in certain circumstances, but what they really demand out of us is how to make these technologies better. How do they work together? How do they get different kinds of outcomes? And how do we function these in different ways? So as you ask the question of how do we work with VMware, we've worked with a lot of predecessors of VMware as uh, VMware has bought a lot of uh, the partners that we've dealt with out of those 2000s, including E8 Security, AirWatch, Carbon Black, obviously, and most recently with SaltStack as well. It's great to see these kind of platforms come together, you know, different platforms come together into a single platform, but that's kind of how clients viewpoint uh, what they want Optiv to do, is how do I get technology A working with technology B to help me become either more efficient or to come up with different outcomes? If I'm moving things from premise to cloud, how does it help me do that? Do I need another technology? And if I add that other technology, I don't want to necessarily look at another console. I'm having trouble looking at the ones I have now. Because as you know, many people understand there's a technology or sorry, not, not a technology shortage, but there's a labor shortage of people who do understand these technologies and understand the underlying problems, whether it's offensive minded or defensive minded, who can put together these technologies in a single way to come up with different outcomes. Sorry, no, that was a very I, long-winded answer to your simple <laughs> question. No, I, I, I love that there's so many directions that we could go. As you were talking, one of the things that came to mind is our former CEO, Pat Gelsinger, now with Intel, frequently would talk about the security space. And he was famous for having this one PowerPoint slide that had, I, I can't remember how many different logos of how many different security companies security technology companies. And his comment was, this is not a good thing. I think at the core, it's complicated. 
And it sounds like one of Opta's key value propositions for your customers is helping them navigate that complexity, which it sounds like is probably only growing in complexity from a cybersecurity standpoint. That's exactly true. And that graphic that you mentioned is produced by Momentum Cyber and they're good friends of ours and we work with them a lot. We actually have our own version of it, but most of the same logos, but just in a different taxonomy structure. But in trying to take our clients who need help in kind of justifying, do I need all of these tools? Do I have to go with the best of breed approach? Or can I go with a platform approach that solves all the vectors that I need? And whether or not people, as you mentioned from a COVID perspective, people now moving to home offices in mass and on in one day, not over time, which not just increased the attack surface from the home aspect of things, would it force different businesses to even incorporate different business models? In other words, companies that were only traditionally in a business to business function or B2B, now all of a sudden had to transform into a direct B2C model, which they just weren't used to. So how to do things like fraud, things that they just didn't have to worry about before. The elasticity of the cloud, which is why people move to the cloud in the first place, but the cloud just works so differently than on-premise environments. And the way you handle how I protected things when it was on my premise versus how it's in the cloud is just incredibly different. And to guide people through those journeys, it's actually incredibly self-satisfying to be able to talk to people through this. and. It's just fun working through people's problems. Todd, as you were saying, it's fun working through people's problems. I have to share that there's a wonderful YouTube video of you from your Optive role talking about being curious and how curiosity has guided your career. I just want to take the opportunity and ask if you want to share with our listeners what the word curious means to you and how you've used that to help keep that passion and that momentum going to help solve your customers' problems. You did your homework on that one. Uh, I don't know how easy that one is to find, but the context of that question is, how does it provide fuel for us and how does it provide motivation? That curiosity function, especially when I was a consultant, and I think I even talked about it, is what kept me going at three o'clock in the morning as I was sitting on a data center floor and where a problem was just overcoming me and I couldn't seem to solve it. The motivation to keep going was like, I really wonder how this is going to work. I really want to see this work. And that curiosity kind of uh, fuels the, I guess, a level of dedication too. But that curiosity is really what the fundamental like emotion that keeps going is like, I want to see how this works and I want to figure it out. You use that feeling and you use that motivation continually as more and more technology comes out and more and more companies come out who are all like these people who are curious and they just see a problem out there. And then they go establish a new technology to go solve that problem. You have to kind of have that curious function to exist in the cyber market because there's just so much of it. And without that curiosity, you're really going to struggle. You're actually going to get quite frustrated without kind of that mindset and just that love of technology. I think given what you just said, you're never going to retire because there's going to be an unending supply of ways to be curious. But I want to circle back and talk about a trend that we're seeing a little bit related to the events of the last year, but something certainly that we're seeing among VMware's customers, which is just an accelerating shift to more of a SaaS-based or subscription-based consumption model for how our customers, our mutual customers want to consume IT and using multiple clouds and using off-premise clouds. And then, of course, looking at how they drive things through to the edge. I'm sure you're seeing that with your customers as well. How is that shaping the concerns that you're seeing or the challenges that you're seeing your customers bring to Optiv? And what are the top ways that that is maybe driving some future transformation in Opta's business? That's a great question. And the trend really hit us probably about three or four years ago. But this consumption model has fueled how people, not just how they consume, but it's how the technology is delivered as well. Traditionally, say 10 years ago, if you wanted a technology, you had to go buy an incredible amount of infrastructure around it to go support it. And then you had this perpetual license model that went through it and support model. And so what that fueled is, It took a lot to deploy the technologies. It took a lot to deploy the infrastructures around the technologies. With the SaaS model, a lot of that went away, which was good because people then could deploy technologies in a much more rapid way. But it did change not just their consumption model for the actual technology and how they consumed that, but also how they consume to get to outcomes further. So we needed to shift instead of to do deployment resources, which now is no longer necessarily needed, 
There's some parts of it, but just drastically reduced. So now it's how do we use the aspect of policy? How do we use the access to behavior within the product? And how do I make it work with other products to get to different outcomes? Because now the infrastructure segment is now kind of just minimized for that. And then to further that as a business consumption model, now we've started to even see a shift. And I say shift, it's just the cloud service providers and Snowflake are driving. That is a usage-based model, and which is going to be a huge differential in from the SaaS model. And what it also gave people an appetite was because people could get things in so easy, it also means they could get them out pretty easy. Mm -hmm. So people continue this dynamic of, well, I tried it for a year, it didn't work. I'm going to try something else this year. And when you had all that infrastructure investment around you, you kind of like were stuck for three years or however long your consumption model for infrastructure was. But now you see people very much dynamic and they're willing to move much faster and they're willing to move quicker, which means we have to move quicker as well. That's interesting. And I can imagine you were talking about talent and maintaining, keeping talent, shortage of talent, because all of this is also based on having people with knowledge of that. How are you helping to keep your talent, your consultants, your experts engaged as your business continues to evolve, customers need different things. Also in light of the ability to remotely work wherever you want, how is that shaping how Talent Optive is helping to take care of your own talent? Well, uh, it's a huge question. And there's the first part of that, which is how do you keep talent up to date with technology? And as it's moving this fast, me coming up uh, from when I came up, there really wasn't a whole lot of dedicated cybersecurity pathways to a career when I first started you kind of developed into it from something else. Like we all came from networking or desktop or some of the application side, and you kind of just developed a bit of a forte for security, and then you kind of shifted into it. Nowadays, people can go straight into security. There's a lot of resources, a lot of education component. But what I don't want to overlook is that knowledge of the underlying plumbing of what makes things work and what makes things tick really make people effective at being security resources. You have to understand how that underlying plumbing works and whether or not that's on premise or in cloud or in virtual environments, you really need to have that understanding. However, for me, it's a little bit difficult because it's like the laws of physics change. You kind of like say, hey, gravity is a constant, you know, <laughs> electromagnetism works in one way. As you move to those different formations, they don't work the same way. And you really have to be able to change not just your techniques, but you have to be able to change your mindsets. And that's very difficult to do, but it's a very way to inspire people to go figure new things out. When your whole spirit of physics, you're not just iterating from one technology to the next, you're actually changing the entire function as you move to how software defined components work to the limits of hardware. And within that, there just opens up a whole new world to motivate your people to go look at different things. So there's no lack of things to go give them to go sink their teeth into that makes them challenged and fuels that curiosity. And hopefully you're hiring people that have that kind of curious mindset. But COVID has certainly driven a whole lot of different things. And I've had to get incredibly creative. I've also used a lot of my peers around me to see what creative things they're coming up with. I mean, I did the traditional stuff for a little while of the virtual happy hours and everything else on Zoom. And yeah, that wasn't enough. I mean, you, how many of those can you have before they get old? Plus, you know, you're just having too many happy hours is what you're doing. <laughs> but it's like how to do things to get people outside. Like I remember we had a team day where it's like, I don't care where you're taking the call from. It's just, it can't be in your house. It can't be inside. Somebody take it from a boat, somebody take it from a lake, just be somewhere else, be moving. And then to see that evolving, I'm doing like more healthy aspects of things. You know, how can you do competitive things to like who can take more steps in a day and put those healthy competitive aspects that are just so much better than, than just like, hey, let's let's uh, let's all have a drink on Friday at uh, four. <laughs> Yeah, I think we've all been to how many online mixology classes can you go to? How many online cooking team building workshops? I think we've mutually exhausted just about every different version of that. As I've talked to a number of different executives about how they've coped with those things last year, you know, they've remarked on the irony or the kind of the tension between on one hand, we are more isolated than we've been. But on the other hand, we have been more personally connected and had visibility into people's personal lives in the way we never did from kids in the background to the cat walking across the, the keyboard to taking the call from the boat and having that. It's been an interesting. 
how would you say overall you've been most tested or grown as a leader over the last year? I think you hit on the the main part is you've had to develop a much more personal connection with your direct reports and maybe two or three levels down and that you've had to force yourself because there's no longer, there's no excuse. There's no, I'm running to the airport. And if they're having problems, you tended to kind of skip around them. Oh, they'll solve their own problems. But in some cases they don't and they need help. And you actually, you're forced to deal with that. And so I, I've been guilty of it. It's like, well, hey, I'd love to talk about this, but I got to go grab on, I got to go jump on a plane. You're forced to deal with that and you have to deal with it in a very positive way. And sometimes like anything, you're having bad days, you're trying to do it in a face-to-face in a video. I actually did a non-video call last week. It was like a 10-person conference call and it was absolutely hysterical. Nobody knew how to do a 10-person conference call without video anymore. We just didn't know how to do it. People like didn't know who was talking and but it's actually relishing in it. It's actually, hey, we're all in the same boat, so let's see what we can do and make this work. But keeping that positive aspect and keeping that mindset of, even when you may not be feeling all positive towards your team, is something I've had to personally develop. Maybe some people can do it very easily, but uh, I've had to work on it pretty hard. Interesting. Well, I think we've all grown in ways we didn't anticipate (laughs) as leaders, as peers, as colleagues over the last year. And it'll be interesting to see how we maintain that as we come back to -to face-to-face situations and navigate that. So more opportunity to learn and develop. There is one particular thing I'm looking forward to is that I don't have to see my face on camera. You know, when we get out of this thing, I am so tired of seeing my own image. I'm not used to seeing myself this much and uh, I'm just tired of it. I think that ends up being stressful for a lot of us. As we look with hopefully the world reopening over the next year and getting back to a sense of new normal, Back to the topic of security, and I think the remote work and the drivers will continue to be ever-present in ways that they weren't before. What are some of the other top areas of key drivers or trends that you're seeing emerge in the industry from a security perspective that you think are going to shape the way Optiv engages with clients over the next two to three years? Well, it's a great question and there are particular drivers and then, you know, they start at the macro level and then they kind of work down to the micro. But at the macro level, understanding that at some concept or component, we're not going to necessarily all go back to an office immediately. It may shift over time. It may take a while, but at some level, the aspect of the attack surface is going to stay extended into the homes. And then the people, like I mentioned, who have changed their business models and the organizations and companies who have done that, they're not going to go back to their old brick and mortar. They might extend, reopen the brick and mortar, but they're not going to shut down the components that they built during this and provide interesting things for them. So there's two aspects to that. One is we're going to have to figure out how to put the corporate controls and the corporate environments into people's houses and into people's lives a little bit particularly to like highly regulated environments where it just wasn't designed for like call center applications to be done at home. And then you think of like telemedicine and telehealth and how we've had to establish controls. Those were never meant to necessarily be extended to the households. And we're going to have to figure out ways to go back and put in those data controls and those just personal controls about what you can say on an unencrypted channel, or it might be an encrypted channel, but it's open storage without encryption on the data after it gets recorded. So you're going to have to have kind of this relook at all these things we've done over the past several years, over the past several months, I should say. And what do we need to go change? What needs to be redone, Uh, at least on, on the home front? And then on the business model side, the same thing. You saw people rapidly move into these new business models and they've opened themselves up to different things. And you see like things I've had probably more conversations on anti fraud and account takeover in the past, like, say, six months than I've had in my previous 16 and a half years combined at Optiv. It was always an issue, but it's just become such a magnified issue, especially when all of these companies and organizations who didn't deal with the B2C function now have to deal with it. And so, and they don't necessarily know how. So it's fueled a lot of different technology and a lot of different components. And then uh, the data component, data is now moving around all over the place. You think of how data has moved. And when you think about it at its root, Data is the target of everybody. I mean, you know, that's that's what people are after. They may be looking at different ways to get it through your endpoint, through your network, 
or through your servers or through your applications, but they're all everybody's after data from an attacker standpoint. And so as this data shifts around, it moves around and it's not just data at rest and data in motion like we used to think of things. It's now data in use function, and that all changes as applications move around as well. So that's a driving trend. And then, you know, the two particular ones that are really uh, top of mind to everybody right now are third-party risk, which is being driven by solar winds and, and other previous components, and then components after that. How are you getting software, and what impact does it have to the environment? And how do you get updates to that software and what impact could that have to your environment, particularly to a segment of what's called resiliency, which is meaning if I have a cyber event, do I continue to have a business? That's really what people need to understand is like if I have a cyber event that forces me to shut down certain systems, can I still run my business? And as ransomware, which is the other one that's really coming at it from a different front, also points to that resiliency function. Can my organization still exist after I've had a cyber event and how can it exist? Maybe in a reduced state or does it go to nothing? But both of those components are really top of mind for people and those are driving trends that we've had to build a lot of services around and a lot of mindset shifts around as well. I think the entire security landscape is fascinating. We've seen accelerated trends in all aspects of what we call digital transformation over the year. And I think the the whole security area is no exception. I was just taking lots of notes as you were talking about all those trends, Todd. And I think every one of those, we could spend an hour talking about what's happening in that area. So certainly a lot for you to continue to be curious about as you continue to work with customers and move that into the future. I wanted to ask you one question about a philosophy around security and get your take on this. So VMware strategy has been, as you were talking about the attack service and data being at the core of what people are trying to get to, VMware has pursued a strategy of intrinsic security. We want to build security into everything so that we minimize it and have security be built in. Do you believe that that is a strategy which is the right one to pursue, or is that going to be a strategy with other mechanisms to be able to help deliver the control, the protection that your customers need? I totally agree with the intrinsic security functionality is we all will keep talking about the attack surface like growing. Why does the attack surface keep growing is because people didn't build security into, like I said, as data moves around or as apps move around. People didn't think to build security into them from the start. So that's why the attack surface moves is because attackers start recognizing that, oh, this thing was built without security. So let's go take advantage of that. So that intrinsic security, especially as technology develops over time, as well as just how we as people and consumers, how do we consume everyday technology? You think about how much your life is ruled by it now particularly in developed countries like the U.S. and and Western Europe and and several others, to how much technology is meaningful for you. And if that has an impact and and if parts of that go away, I always love my wife, uh, you know, I always love my wife, but (laughs) but she deals with me in certain ways in my curiosity ways of things of when you go to a restaurant and they ask for your phone number, I kind of refuse to give it. And the looks on the, the hostess's face, they're like, well, then they literally have no idea what to do. They, they can't work without a function of technology. They're like, well, how am I going to call you for your reser- when your uh, table's ready? I'm like, well, put in your phone number and let it text you, and then you can yell my name, and I'll be standing over here. It's those kinds of like intrinsic functions to where it's like, don't give out your personal information if people don't need to have it. it so it's not just the technology intrinsic. It's also the mindset of people. Stop giving away your personal and private data as a function. Anybody ask for your phone number? Why do they need that? Do they really absolutely have to have it? And if they tell you like, well, it doesn't really matter. We're just tracking it for like consumption models. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is my phone number. And I missed a digit there. <laughs> so, but don't give away data that you don't have to. People ask you for your social security number, your address, your birthday. Don't give it away if they don't need to have it. There's actually very few people by regulatory and statutory that have to have that information. And then change your mindsets of what you publish on social media and how much you give away about yourself to the general public. That has value. That opens up a tax service. So to continue that concept of intrinsic, it's also put intrinsic security into our own lives, put intrinsic security 
into all of our technology sets. So I, I firmly believe in that intrinsic ability. And then when people talk about zero trust models, that's just a negative threat model, meaning like what we all traditionally came up with is like, well, allow everything and we'll deny the specific stuff that we don't want to have happen. Now people are going to have to change their mindsets or have fundamentally been, let's deny everything and only permit the little bits of things that absolutely are needed to go work. While it's pretty much going to be necessary, particularly in business app side of things, it depresses me to a certain extent is the internet was created to make a more open society an exchange of ideas. And now we're going to be restricting that in so many different ways, but it unfortunately is necessary. Yeah, I think human nature brings the need to consider and think intentionally whenever we have any of those mediums. It's just been been the way it'll be. But I think I've appreciated hearing you kind of challenge the mindset. I think thinking about how we give data away personally and professionally is an important consideration. And it's it shifted some of my thinking. I want to wrap up, Todd, with a couple of fun lightning round questions. Okay. Um, I would love to know what, and, I, and now I don't even know if you're using any of these on your phone, given the fact that they might cause you to give away information, but what is a new app that you're using on the phone that is particularly fun or interesting or helped you be more productive? The most interesting one I've had to use now, and my family has developed a bit of a food allergy, and I don't know how that happened. So I use this app called Spoonful which is helpful because you can just scan, you know, things at the grocery store and it'll tell you not just all the ingredients, but it'll tell you based on what food allergy, whether or not it's gluten or particular things for FODMAP or everything else that will tell you that particular item in relation to that. And it can tell you, well, take in moderate amounts or like really stay away from. And it's really been educational to kind of like go through how much stuff I was buying at the grocery store that apparently my entire family is allergic to. So. <laughs> Uh, I, I have not heard of that one. That is fascinating. I want to check that out. We've got a number of those different eating cons food considerations in our across our family as well. It sounds like it's both productive and keeping your family healthy as, as interesting. You've spent, I'm sure, a lot more time at home, not traveling and more close to home. Have you had the opportunity to pick up any new hobbies or pick back up hobbies that you hadn't had time for during the, the last year? The incredibly sad part is picking up a new hobby of just spending so much time with my family, which is you sound like it's an intrinsic thing that you should be doing anyway, and it is. But having to spend more and more time with my family is I consider to be a hobby that I picked up. And I'm just incredibly thankful that I really enjoy my family as much <laughs> as I do, because I think if like, wow, if we didn't get along and we spent this much time together, <laughs> think, uh, you know, I try to think about how difficult it would be. But playing family games and playing like ways to spend the time and ways to, to deal with my daughter and learning. I didn't have to be the teacher. My wife was the teacher kind of in the family and I've had to necessarily pick up things. And of course, my uh, bombastic attitude of like, well, no, that's not how you do math. You do math this way and you, you have to adapt. And because she didn't learn math the same way I did, you know, you have to get humble like in certain <laughs> ways. But uh, as far as a hobby, I've picked up spending so much time with my family, which is I'm incredibly thankful for, but I'm also incredibly sorry that I had to pick it up. Well, it's nice that in some ways, the blessings we've had, you've gotten to be more personal with your own family, as well as the people that you work with, given the time that you've had. Fun story. My husband works for Intel. So when Pat Gelsinger went from VMware to Intel, he just went from my office to my husband's office on the other side of the wall. And he was sharing recently a story with Intel employees that, I mean, and he traveled 200 days a year just an insane amount of time that he has had more dinners with his wife, Linda, in the last year than he probably has ever had because we've been able to spend time with our families. So that's lovely that you've had time with yours. Last question, Todd, I know that Optiv has some philanthropies that it particularly uh, invests in and support. I was wondering what philanthropic organization or cause you're most passionate about? Well, from a personal standpoint, it has been the Phoenix Children's Chorus, which uh, my daughter is involved with. And during COVID, that was really hard to go sing in a group because you weren't supposed to do that sort of stuff. But I just had never realized how much joy the, the kids had gotten out of like singing together and being together and learning about music. And I know nothing about music. To have my daughter teach me how to read music and do quarter notes and that sort of stuff. 
which I still don't know anything about music, so please don't, nobody quiz me on this, but I've just seen many underprivileged kids who find joy in this is the one thing that is a creative outlet for them and to, to see what joy that creates for people. And then uh, they just had their first event last weekend together in kind of an open setting. And to see them all singing together again was uh, just, it was very fulfilling. So, Oh, that's great. It's so nice to see our children be able to come back together There's just nothing that compares with that personal. And I'm sure they also were able to use technology to still create that song together, but it's nice to be able to be back in person. The amount of creativity I saw during the time was was incredible in how they can create music, even still by not being together. I think that creative spirit persists. That is one of the, the good parts of human nature, so that we've all really seen rise to the occasion over the last year. Well, Todd, thank you so much for joining me today. I've really been inspired by your curiosity in all things, particularly in the areas of cybersecurity and just the fascinating field that has continued to challenge customers, but provide lots of opportunities for Optive and your crew to help solve problems in very creative ways. So thanks so much. Thanks for having me. It's great. And we're back. Many thanks to Todd for reminding us about the absolute importance of protecting and securing our personal and professional data. We hope you enjoyed that conversation. To learn more about Optive, please visit Optive.com. And to connect with Todd, you can find him on LinkedIn. Please subscribe, follow, and review VMware Partnership Perspectives from your streaming platform of choice. For more information on VMware's partner programs, please visit VMware Executive Edge at VMware.com. I'm Kathleen Tandy, and you're listening to VMware Partnership Perspectives. Thanks for your time, and I hope you'll listen again soon.